Hello and welcome to our fourth session of the Tokyo International University Global Dialogue. This session is a roundtable on innovative approaches to transitional justice with a focus on art, temporality, and memory. It is being held in cooperation with Montclair State University in New Jersey. I am Chris Lamont, an Associate Professor of International Relations here at Tokyo International University, and I'm delighted to welcome our four guest speakers who are joining us tonight. Well, tonight here in, in Tokyo, our speakers are joining us from the United States, Australia, and Germany, where it is early in the morning, even later at night, and sometime in the afternoon, respectively. First, we have Lauren Velasco, who is an assistant professor of political science at Stockton University in Galloway, New Jersey. Her research centers on transformative and transitional justice work in the Americas. Next, I would like to welcome Elisa Garncy, who is a British Academy postdoctoral fellow in international relations at the University of Cambridge, whose recent book, explores how art can engage and shape ideas of transitional justice. And then of course, we have Arno Kurtz, who is Associate Professor of Justice Studies at Montclair State University, and is currently a Global Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, DC. His work focuses on memory politics, social movements, and art. And we also have Mariam Salehi, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Glo Global Governance Unit at the Berlin Social, the Social Science Center in Germany. Her work focuses on the politics of transitional justice in Tunisia. Our roundtable today is aimed at exploring how transitional justice as a field is increasingly confronted by justice demands and challenges that have up until recently received comparatively little attention among scholars and practitioners of transitional justice. By focusing on how art, temporality, and memory provide frameworks for illuminating alternative spaces for theorizing transitional justice that break from more traditional approaches, our panelists will shed light on interactions and linkages between these spaces while also drawing upon their rich empirical work. For our audience, if you have questions and you would like to address that you would like to address to our panelists, you are welcome to write them in the question and answer tab that should be visible to you at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Once our panelists have had their initial discussion, we'll be happy to respond to as many questions as time may permit. So now I'll turn to our first topic of discussion. The first question of the roundtable comes from an observation about an increasing uneasiness with the limitations of transitional justice. And this is juxtaposed against the widening scope of demands being placed upon transitional justice. Gone are the days of transitional justice being seen as a narrow set of measures to be implemented in the context of transitions to democracy or transitions from war to peace. Instead, calls for transitional justice are increasingly seen in the context of dealing with the legacies of more distant crimes and in the context of states that are not necessarily undergoing political transition in a classical sense. Take, for example, challenges of addressing colonial harms and also calls for transitional justice in the context of the United States. Indeed, transitional justice has been critiqued on the grounds that its narrow definition of transition creates certain categories of crime and also temporalities of abuse that are privileged within transitional justice practice. There are several lines of critique. One, the focus on bodily harm crimes over socioeconomic crimes, and also the focus on crimes of the recent past over crimes of the more distant past. But what does this mean for transitional justice scholarship and practice? How do we understand and make sense of the distant afterlives of transitional justice measures? And how are transitional justice measures lived and experienced by those who interact with them? This brings me to my first question, which I'll pose to, in, in the first instance, to Elisa. What are the major challenges, theoretical, methodological, and practical 
that have emerged in the field in recent years. Thanks so much, Chris. I think, um, it, you know, the, the challenges you've just outlined are, are so great that one of the emerging um, areas of the field that's really burgeoning is in relation to the space of justice and where kind of transitional justice processes um, are not only kind of held in physical spaces, um, but also, as, as you touched upon, the this kind of idea of um, the critique of transitional justice of looking at the more recent past or the long term past and how does that affect people emotionally um, and the kind of intergenerational trauma that these creates. So I think one of the, um, the kind of um, burgeoning areas of transitional justice is a focus um, on effective spaces. Um, and this is becoming really recognized within the field as something that's really important. And by effective spaces, I mean the emotional um, and the mental spaces of justice and the feelings um, and memories which surround conflict and repair. And I think these dimensions are, are critical to the field uh, because transitional justice is essentially inseparable from feelings of justice. Uh, it's a process of justice that relies on being seen and being felt to be effective. Um, and often, you know, as you touched upon, on a very large scale. So it's only through kind of emotional buy-in um, as well as a procedural buy-in um, to transitional justice processes that kind of transition can occur. So in one sense, um, I guess transitional justice isn't just unless it's seen and, and felt to be so um, and thought to be so as well. So this is one of the major challenges, I think, in the field. Um, but also in order to understand um, these effective spaces, I think what's becoming really widely acknowledged in transitional justice and what I'm very passionate and excited about is that the idea that there are aesthetic and creative ways to pursue uh, transitional justice. Um, and these are ways which have the capacity to address um, some of the challenges you raised about um, identity divisions and exclusions in ways that perhaps other um, transitional justice processes can't or can't do as effectively. Um, so creative responses, and I, and I mean by that such as art, film, uh, music, um, can really create these effective spaces um, that can facilitate a recognition um, of past wrongs, both, both recent um, and more, more distant, as well as feelings of experience. Uh, and they can provoke us really kind of um, to travel into another person's world, kind of thinking our way uh, into their universe. And I think this recognition is really essential in order to kind of to comprehend it and acknowledge, but also respond um, to the diverse claims of individuals and groups that have been affected by conflict, uh, both directly and then the longer term indirect um, effects as well. So I'm, I might leave that one there. And um, perhaps I think um, if I can just end on one sentence, maybe I think the, the kind of the growing interest in effective spaces um, really reflects the perspective that um, I guess a holistic view of transitional justice uh, needs to include legal, social um, and cultural mechanisms. Um, and I might actually um, pass on to Marion because I think that connects with her research into um, kind of what is uh, permissible in transitional justice or what's included and what isn't. Yeah, thanks, Chris, for the introduction and Eliza for um, kicking off the roundtable. And um, following up on this, um, I'm sharing my screen here and um, I would like to talk about that um, transitional justice is often seen as a bubble, a bubble of people and ideas. Um, so if you, if you look at the literature, you often see um, the expression of a technocratic bubble or a legalistic bubble or a bubble of practitioners and academics. And in my research, I often encountered discussions about whether transitional justice um, is paying enough attention to what else is happening in transitional societies. So what else is happening outside of that bubble? So um, yeah, I encountered critique towards um, those directly working on transitional justice saying that um, they are not engaging enough with, uh, with other processes in Tunisia, for example, with 
like what happened with the constitution, with other conflicting dynamics, um, as, as Chris said, also not paying attention enough to social economic issues. And one point that I think is important here is that transitional justice as a bubble um, might try to take on too much on its own. Um, yeah, following up on what Eliza said about the holistic approach. So if you try to incorporate everything in your bubble, then um, yeah, it, it, it might just might be too much to take on. So, um, but if we think in bubbles, um, bubbles might, may actually burst if one tries to reach out and to go beyond the bubble, right? To make these connections. So, um, I would like us to picture transitional justice otherwise, and uh, would suggest that if we think more of transitional justice as an island, um, we still acknowledge the insular tendencies that transitional justice might have, but it may be easier to make connections to other physical or effective spaces, as um, Eliza said, to other processes of change that are going on in transitional societies, to other academic fields or fields of practice, and to other communities that are usually not um, captured by what we traditionally see as um, spaces of transitional justice. I'll leave it here for now. Great. Thank you um, so much. Um, it's really a, a, a great pleasure to, to be part of this uh, round table and especially trying to, as, as Mariam said, trying to expand um, the, the linkages between the different um, parts that we're trying to uh, address here. And um, while I'm generally speaking uh, much in the same boat as Eliza with regards to um, art and, and sort of the, um, the spectrum of youth activism and alternative uh, justice. I wanna take us um, somewhere else today and um, it might get a bit more technical than, than usual. And, and the focus here is on harnessing geomapping tools for, for transitional justice. But first of all, what, what do I mean by geomapping tools? Well, we're all too familiar with COVID-19 charts and graphs that have haunted us for the past year. Uh, but they help us visualize large amount of data and depending on the format, they also help us better understand specific situation. So here's what, what my short little proposal is for sort of visualization efforts in transitional justice because they ought to be similar yet weirdly enough, um, they have been ignored for many years. When we contextualize big data and transitional justice, one could for instance think of um, our colleagues Lee Payne and Andrew Reiter's work on, on really spearheading that effort um, to collect large amounts of data and capture broader trends, um, especially with time and space. Um, but the visualization processes and, and the formats have really um, not been at the, at the game or the height of the game, um, if one, one may say so. And so I wanna briefly um, share, share my screen here and in an effort to call um, for, for a broader visualization strategy here, I want to introduce geomapping not only with the geographic information systems, the typical GIS where we have a map, but also with regards to different formats that over time could be really helpful, especially in my research, to connect time, space, and agency, right? And, and so here we see a brief uh, work in progress where we see different alternative measures, for instance, oral history projects or uh, performance art, or again, protests. And um, this is just a time span over the last 10 years. And we see the solid line um, on the upper third that says events, that's sort of the general category because I've also um, switched between alternative and more traditional mechanisms. But long story short, this is a different way of seeing how globally speaking, um, things might have had different emphasis. And um, this is not the only way of, of visualizing data. Another form um, could be, for instance, if we look at um, graph-based and, and document analyses, and um, that, that could be a way of highlighting power structures or yet another one with heat maps, right? When we use more social media related um, analysis. And so in, in a nutshell, 
um, to, to sort of wrap up this brief intro, because I'm, I'm certain there might be questions or sort of a, a lively debate on this. I think uh, we ought to embrace these tools and, and use them also for our analysis. And that is, has until now been lacking. And, and I'm glad there is an increasing interest in this. And with that, I will uh, turn the mic over um, to our next participant, Lord. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. And I'm so happy to be with uh, such a wonderful group of scholars. I want to touch back to some of Chris's earlier points about this very narrow conception of political transition. Um, early work of transitional justice has often, uh, or early work on transitional justice was tied to this political transition paradigm, right? Where we had these assumptions of a linear process to democratic consolidation, that it would work in a series of stages and that transitional justice was integral to, these th to, to this process. And we know that the world looks quite different now, right? We see the emergence of hybrid regimes, right? Political regimes that contain democratic and authoritarian elements. We've seen over the past 15 years, a process of de-democratization. And we've seen transitional justice deployed in many areas where there's no political transition as Chris uh, touched upon. And yet we have this massive expansion of a transitional justice industry, right? And academics are included in this, where we are doing a lot more in-depth research on what victims and survivors expect of the process. And what we're arriving to is this question of whether or not transitional justice mechanisms are overpromising and perhaps underperforming. And so one intervention uh, that I've been reflecting on in my own work is this idea of transformative justice. And transformative justice has really emerged out of a critique of how the field has evolved. Uh, in particular, it has targeted how legalistic and how perhaps narrow of a conception transitional justice was early on. And it says instead of us focusing on the state, we should focus more on local processes, uh, that there's a connection between the structural violence and the socioeconomic inequalities that uh, exist in present day with past legacies of mass atrocity and human rights violations, and that there should be more of an emphasis on the process of justice rather than a particular outcome. But transformative justice has come with its own set of critiques, right? And right now it's been primarily a set of normative ideas for how we may re-envision these justice processes. Um, but what I'm really interested in and what some of the emerging work is starting to show is, you know, should we think about transforming transitional justice mechanisms, which might lead us to once again, overburden them and lead um, citizens, right? With, a, with an overpromised vision of what they can do in terms of reforming structures and institutions. Should we think about the intersection of transformative justice work and more tradi traditional transitional justice mechanisms? Or should we really think about transformative justice as a field unto itself? And that's where we get into some really interesting uh, empirical work, right? Of seeing how justice claims and, and social movements and, and citizens are organizing their own set of expectations for justice that may not be accomplished through these traditional avenues that we've looked at in the field. Um, I'm going to stop there for a second, we can talk about this further during the Q&A, and I thought it would be useful for us to transition to our next question um, about the significance of art and how it and its relationship to transitional justice and how it's affected transitional justice. And Elisa, would you mind uh, starting us off? Thank you. I, I love that question um, because, of course, that's that's what I'm so interested in looking at is this relationship between art and transitional justice. And I think kind of as my governing thought, what I would say is, is fundamentally art significance to transitional justice is that art can become a radical form of political uh, participation in times of transition. And I really think um, it does this in a number of ways, or it can do this in a number of ways, uh, uh, probably four key ways. So 
in the first instance, um, art helps to circulate sentiment, the memories and emotions um, which go into the process um, of remembering. It, it can also mediate uh, the telling of people's stories um, and experiences so that what is seen and said um, about conflict and who has the ability to see it and say it um, is really expanded. I think thirdly, it can also create encounters um, between people. Um, and these encounters can really intervene or unsettle the, the dominant narrative um, around transitional justice and around the past. And finally, it can also invent new spaces um, of justice. And this is what I touched upon um, in, the, in, in the first question, um, both physical spaces um, where justice perhaps uh, normally wouldn't be considered to be occurring, such as exhibitions and collections, um, but also these effective spaces, uh, which I touched upon. And so um, I just want to give a bit of an example. I'm going to share my screen now just to make that a bit more tangible. Um, there we go. So on the screen, is um, an image of an artwork and it's called The Man Who Sang and the Woman Who Kept Silent. It's more commonly known as the Blue Dress. Uh, it's by the South African artist, Judith Mason. So this is a three-part installation that hangs um, inside the Constitutional Court of South Africa in Johannesburg. And it's a court which is important um, because it's the most significant institution to emerge out of the country's transition um, from apartheid to democracy. And it's a unique space, um, especially by international comparison, because it houses a large visual art collection about human rights um, that was developed by the court for the court. So the blue dress um, I would suggest simultaneously um, commemorates and also intervenes in um, dominant transitional justice narratives in South Africa. So for instance, on the one hand, um, this artwork commemorates and memorializes uh, Pila Ndwandwe, who was a member of the African National Congress who was fighting for freedom from apartheid. Um, and the story of her disappearance, uh, torture and murder uh, at the hands of the security um, forces in South Africa emerged during the amnesty hearings of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So on the other hand, the artwork gestures um, more generally to women's experiences in anti-apartheid struggles. And the way in which it does this is critical because uh, South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission really um, has been widely critiqued for failing to address the experiences of many women under apartheid. Um, and this is especially in relation to the politics around sexual and gender-based violence. Um, so the blue dress draws attention um, to the suspected sexual violence experienced by Ndwandwe, um, which the commission failed to acknowledge. Um, and in doing so, the artwork comes to symbolize the many victims and survivors um, of this uh, kind of violence, um, whose stories really remain absent from the official record. So not only is the blue dress um, a response to transitional justice processes, um, but its presence at the center of South Africa's constitutional democracy really serves as a critical reminder um, of what is, is missing elsewhere. So I'm conscious I can't really um, do justice fully to, to the artwork um, in, in kind of this, this brief snapshot, but I do want to uh, just wrap up by saying that um, I think the significance of art to transitional justice is it can enable and support it. And it also has the potential to communicate justice in powerful and meaningful ways. Because I think ultimately without art, uh, transitional justice will fail to fully comprehend and respond um, to the injustices, which are the long-term causes of conflict. Um, and so the example I've, I've flagged here is, um, and kind of the way I've been talking about art is really uh, in relation to state institutions and in an institutional context. Um, and I know Amo's work um, looks at art from a very different perspective. Um, so I might pass on, pass on there. Thank you so much, Eliza. And it's always so inspiring to, to listen to you and, and to see how your work has evolved over, over time. 
and, and gravitates, of course, during aesthetics, but also now the, the effective spaces. And, and we will get in, in our third and last question later, uh, we will um, tease out more of the linkages. But as Eliza said here, I, I will really home in into um, the opposite spectrum now, because I think what Eliza clearly and nicely showed is the value and the symbolic value for transitional justice processes if it's um, not necessarily hijacked, sometimes it is in certain government institutions, but if it's really instrumentalized and used by, by the official side to, to deal with the past. I, I wanna shed some light here in the few moments that I have on what if there is no official response or the official response is lacking, then art all of a sudden becomes sort of a catalyst to raise uh, an unheard or, or lesser heard or marginalized voice. And um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick with a, a classic example um, that you might have heard of or you might not, but it's, an, it, it's dated. Here we see a, um, a teenager or a, a young adult um, laying down a rose on what seems to be a, a, a red dotted area, right? And these are the so-called Sarajevo roses, which were shelling impacts. And unfortunately, when they hit um, people or bystanders, they of course um, left red blood marks. And so in the aftermath of the um, conflict in Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, activists um, and, and, and sort of um, supporters to commemorate these moments put red resin into these, um, in, into these places. And so um, in sort of a more guerrilla type action, activists have in more recent years um, kept those up and created certain mini ceremonies and reminders to commemorate uh, the victims and to commemorate the, the siege of Sarajevo. Right, and and that's that's an angle that I want to briefly touch upon. That's different from from what Eliza has done, and that expands the art. It's sort of this performative aspect, right? Here you engage with society directly, and it's not always positive, right? It's not as if everyone runs to to the activists or or the NGO folks um, um, staging this. It's like this is a great this is a great initiative. Sometimes there it's it's highly criticized, right? And and I think it's really important to bring in, when we talk about grassroots at the bottom up, what the role of social movements are in, in, these, um, in these contexts. And as I said earlier, when we think about the Arab Spring um, and, and sort of the uprisings that happened um, over the past decade, I think we've seen an Arab Spring that turned to a winter with uh, the classic example of Egypt, for instance, um, where Fatah al-Sisi has taken over and shut out every sort of um, opposition. And uh, we only um, can remember sort of these very vivid images of Tahir Square where, where sort of protesters in an effort to remember um, martyrs have sort of painted these walls. And so the, the walls became living symbols. And to bring that back into a more contemporary setup, you might have seen in the New York Times more recently, um, this, um, this graffiti of a young um, autistic Palestinian who was killed by Israeli security forces. And um, I, I wanna sort of show here how important these moments are because in Egypt, for instance, youth and, and opposition has turned to memes and caricatures, right, to, to mock the president. And this is sort of a gray space that really has become very, very important where voices can be raised and resilience can still um, maintain sort of a, a level of coherence and um, um, assure that the past is being dealt with in some form or shape, even though it's not official, right? And so that brings us to, um, to sort of our next section. And as I said, due to time constraints, we can only whet your appetite and hopefully that, that will be um, bringing in a lot of questions and, and we can of course follow up um, in the Q&A. But the, the, the last and third section um, sort of tries to combine these everyday practices of collective memory um, what has time to do with how we deal or think about this, right? Um, the Germans have this term Vergangenheitsbewältigung, a lovely tongue twister that, um, that some of you who study the field might have now mastered to, to say without uh, or flawlessly in front of an audience. 
But now there's a new term and uh, Mariam um, kindly introduced me to Max Cholek, who is sort of a, um, a term uh, Jew who is writing not about Vergangenheitsbewältigung, but about not dealing with the past, but about dealing with the present, Gegenwartsbewältigung. And that's a really interesting concept. And I, I think um, on that notion, I want to sort of um, turn it over to, um, I believe um, Mariam is next, where, where, where we want to look into what space and time has to do with how we deal with this, because there's a lot of different levels. We've seen a state and grassroots level, but there's a lot of in-betweens. And Mariam's work on Tunisia has um, uh, particularly focused um, on, on these dynamics. And uh, without further ado, um, um, I'd be interested to, to hear Mariam um, explore and expand on some of these ideas. And I'll kick off the third um, and last sort of um, big question set here. Yeah, thanks, Anno. So I will mainly talk about uh, time and temporality. And um, apologies for hijacking your metaphor, but I want to pick up the Arab spring, Arab winter. Um, notion that you mentioned again, because I would say if we talk about transitional justice and transition, they are not uh, automatically coming as um, winter is coming after spring at some point. So we don't see a linear process like this um, in transitional justice and also not in transitions. And um, I would like us to look at transitional justice in process as something that is happening and uh, continuously happening. And I would like to go back to um, the political transition uh, question as well. So I'm like talking more about the, um, the realm of, of politics that um, all of you have expanded so far, but like going back to that. And um, I would say what I found is that there are conflicting temporalities also in transitional justice as a longer term conflict resolution idea. Um, with other things going on in uh, political transitions or in, in states of transition that require short term and acute conflict resolution. And um, these conflicting temporalities um, also influence perceptions of, um, in quotation marks, success and failure. And taking the example of Tunisia here, um, there was a short term acute conflict resolution measure uh, which is usually um, presented as a great success that was the Tunisian national dialogue. Um, the civil society organizations that facilitated the national dialogue, um, they won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2015. And um, the transitional justice process, which um, is still continuous and still ongoing, but um, is still um, or is often um, maybe prematurely, maybe not um, described as a failure. And um, I would say that there's an interplay between the success of the national dialogue and the short-term conflict resolution, uh, which may have at least partially set the course for the yeah, so-called failure of the more long-term change that transitional justice aims at. Because um, the logic of the national dialogue was um, focusing more on elite demaking, um, changing the political logic that um, is the transition. And um, this meant that there was, yeah, those who were, were in conflict beforehand and um, actually were pushing for, for longer term change and for longer um, term change in political structures and power relations that um, they were pushed aside and um, those who actually like, yeah, were in power um, made, uh, made deals with each other and um, that close some doors for the longer term transitional justice um, options, longer term conflict resolution to actually um, be successful. And we see these things happening at the same time in Tunisia. So the transitional justice process um, only started taking um, taking on, like or, or started kicking off after this shorter term conflict resolution was already um, going on. So yeah, we have a conflicting temporality here and those things are happening simultaneously, but it only plays out, late, out later for transitional justice when um, the transitional justice process uh, had en encountered the lack of political will and, and ran into some, some dead ends. Yeah. Um, I'm handing over to, um, I don't know anymore whom I'm handing over to. Uh, 
Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Miriam. Um, thank you for bringing up the uh, Tunisia case. I think for, for my two points about temporality, it's worth thinking about two cases, and that's Brazil and the United States. Um, in the 2014 Truth Commission in Brazil, what was quite notable um, is that the authors actually say right out in front that the current human rights abuses, including the level of state violence and police brutality that are happening in the country, are directly related and, and correspond to the military dictatorship. Uh, and, and that because the past is seen as unresolved or at least un unacknowledged, there's this huge problem, right, with, with police violence and, and the criminal justice system in Brazil. Similarly, in the United States, there is, I think, more conversation within the mainstream discourse about how a potential transitional justice process, whether it's a truth commission or a set of reparations, can not only account for the genocide of indigenous peoples here and slavery, but that we have to understand mass incarceration and the criminal justice complex, uh, like in all really to understand these two um, huge parts of our society, we have to draw back to Jim Crow and to slavery. And so transitional justice may serve as a potential intervention to start to acknowledge these connections. So what these two cases get at um, are two main issues that I think we should think about when we think about temporality. The first concerns the relationship between the global north and the global south, right? And I think within the field, we are having this sort of reckoning or reflection about where and how justice, transitional justice emerges and then how is it studied, right? And so when we think about it in the case of the United States, right, or in Canada, these consolidated democracies, uh, there needs to be some introspection, right? And it's the same for the question of colonialism, as Chris mentioned earlier. Uh, historically, transitional justice has really only focused on these very specific issues, and yet somehow the legacy of colonialism and repression and, and uh, the state violence that occurred as part of those processes have been left for the most part unaccounted for. And then the last challenge with temporality, I think there's still a lot of work to be done within the field that focuses on the relationship between transitional justice and long-term institutional reforms, right? Which some may um, see as non-recurrence. This is the idea that we have to think about the space on which, um, you know, can, does transitional justice operate as an island as Miriam um, so rightly kind of pointed out or can we actually see it have an impact? We know that in, in many cases, old elites, old political elites, even politicians um, from the former regime are often elected back into power uh, in this new phase of democracy. We've seen authoritarian strategies and laws used by leaders uh, who are elected democratically. And there's also serious criminal justice uh, concerns that you know, some of the abuses used by state agents reflect what the past uh, resembles, even though it's not against political actors, it, it's, it's against the poor, right? And, and there's an economic component to it. And then finally, there's these questions of land, dispossession and disenfranchisement. These things are not gonna be resolved within even maybe like a five to 10 year period, but they are continual claims to justice that happen even after these more immediate mechanisms take place. I think I'm now passing it over to Chris for some final words. Thank you so much for that, Lauren, and for for all our speakers. It's it's really a pleasure to to be able to to summarize kind of after all of these these interventions. But but to like to say kind of two last words, and and one will I guess focus on this this over promising that that Miriam brought up and that others had spoken to as well in terms of transitional justice. And, and not being able to, to meet those expectations that, that are generated at the beginning of a transitional justice process and kind of leading to, kind of, as Miriam said, in the context of Tunisia, perhaps premature calls that the, or refer, um, references to the failure of, of transitional justice in that context, but also this, the, the notion of spaces that, that Elisa and, and Arnaud have been dealing with 
And, and on top of that, the temporalities elements that, that Lauren has discussed. And in relation to overpromising, um, you get this a lot. And, and perhaps it's because um, these, these official measures, right, these, these official processes are, are largely sites of elite contestation, right, between kind of old elites and new elites. And as we saw with the national dialogue, um, you get compromises that are good for the transition, but maybe bad for transitional justice. But beyond that, they're, they're, they're rarefied spaces, right? They're, they're kind of, they're, they're detached from the, the very audiences that, that transitional justice measures aim to speak to. So, so perhaps we're, we're looking um, for, for transitional justice to happen in, in kind of these, these wrong, in, in not exactly the right spaces. And with that, right, what other spaces are there and where is the interesting contestation happening within, within societies? And, and this is something that, that Elisa and Arnaud really kind of emphasized in their response to the question about, about art, that when you move away from these unofficial spaces or to move away from the official spaces, these unofficial spaces aren't as bound by kind of the, the kind of the legalistic mandates that, that restrict temporality. And you can have a blurring of temporalities. You can even have as, as Arnaud highlighted to us in that one image, a kind of blurring of geographies as, as well. And, and perhaps both in the past and the present, this is where kind of a lot of the more interesting contestation is, is taking place. And kind of by focusing on this, you can kind of bring together this, this past and the present element through, through these spaces. And um, we want to have, time, enough time to, to deal with or to, to respond to the questions from, from the audience. So, so with that, I'll once again thank um, our, our speakers um, for all of their um, interventions. And I'll go to the first question that was posed. And it is to Elisa, um, who is talking of facilitating spaces through arts and media. How exactly would you balance the division of in instances of transition from civil war um, to be found in art and media and how would it deal with the divergent emotions and perspectives of the same occurrence of the past, like from the perspective of Sri Lanka, the divided perspectives and injustice of 30 years of civil war has brought in more divided tension in the aspect of art and media. So how do we find the balance in these sensitive contexts? That is such a good question. Um, thank you. Um, thank you to the person who posed that question. And I think, um, I mean, that's, it, it has many parts. So um, I'll, I'll see if I can answer. I think the, the, the headline I would take away from that question is around how does art deal with divergent emotions? Um, so fundamentally, when we have um, conflicting narratives about what's happened, how can those be accommodated? And that is so important. And I, I think actually, um, that question's touched upon the heart of, um, you know, why I advocate for art and creative practices is because within transitional justice contexts is because um, art can accommodate tensions um, and conflicting emotions in ways that um, other processes or mechanisms can't. Um, the beauty of art is that the intention of its creator isn't um, always how it's uh, received. In fact, you know, viewers and audiences um, receive things very differently. And this also speaks to um, what Lauren and Miriam are saying about conflicting temporalities and, and what Chris is talking about, the kind of collision of the past and the present is that um, the meaning of art changes over time um, from when it was created. Uh, so, so kind of generations of people who view it have very different um, responses. And in that way, it's, um, it, it, it makes it um, permissible to kind of accommodate these tensions um, or divergent emotions as the, the, the question has said. Uh, but also uh, I think um, what's important is that it, it enables um, a different kind of dissent or dissent to be had in a in a different way. It allows, it makes promotions admissible, uh, not admissible, sorry, permissible, I mean, um, to, to begin with, um, but also allows dissent in a, in kind of, um, I don't want to say in a, in a, in a softer way, but in a way that perhaps is um, more 
digestible or, or um, um, easier to have debate. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have another question, and this is kind of a little bit more specific. And I think it's kind of, I think any of us could, could respond to it. It's from Kazi Rahman, and he is a student here at Tokyo International University. And he's asking how do transitional justice measures deal with genocide denial um, among communities kind of living together, kind of particularly kind of victims of, of genocide? Um, yeah, Arno, go ahead. If you don't mind, um, because this way I, I can piggyback uh, with what Eliza has said, and because some of the questions that we have are a bit more general, and um, I see also one in the chat. I don't know whether um, everyone sees them or just the panelists by uh, a colleague of mine, David Axelrod, who, who says, like, um, if transitional justice are cyclicals uh, with the persistence of memory, is the long run potential minimized injustice as compared to full justice? Is the mass of injustice dependent then on the population size of a society, right? This is also a very broad question. And, and similar to Eliza's response, I can only give um, certain sort of pushes into a direction where we wanna go. And, and, and I think what's really important with regards to the um, genocide question, Rwanda, I think it boils down to this idea of memory politics um, and, and how oftentimes our collective memory is shaped and sometimes hijacked or instrumentalized, as I said. But I think the, uh, the, the really crux of our panel and discussion today is really to spark a dialogue, right? And, and uh, uh, further down, we have a question also on, on this um, guerrilla art or the practices that, that create more room for, uh, for voices. And, and I think we've seen in recent years how important sort of a democratization of, of sort of participatory approaches to also transitional justice are. That doesn't mean that we should replace one with the other, but I think it does mean what Chris was um, hinting to earlier, that this elite bubble that Mariam also introduced our transitional justice approach um, has has burst right and and so and so we are promoting the islands and and I think uh, we can swim we can take a boat hopefully there won't be too many sharks along the way right uh, but but I, I think um, the importance here is that if um, we create um, a space and that brings us back whether that's effective whether that's virtual or physical right if people need a space where there is a memory, and I'll end my comment on that because it, it's really important in, in the last 20 uh, or 25 years, it has created voices. Everyone's um, familiar with the Holocaust, right? It's um, and all over the world, we commemorate it. I think it's really important um, for, for years and years, a smaller persecuted uh, group, um, the, the LGBT or the gay community, because it was mostly um, gay uh, male, victims um, during, during the Third Reich. Um, there were also lesbian victims, but they were more spared. We, we don't have to get into the reasons, but here what I wanna highlight is this memorial that eventually after decades of fighting was created um, sort of in juxtaposition to the um, Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, but it was really contested. And, and, and sort of um, um, the, the Jewish council in Germany said like, we, our memorial stands for everybody, right? And so uh, then that raises that question. So should, should people like the, the LGBT, um, um, Q plus, et cetera, community also have their own memorial? And then within that memorial, they were showing a video that was also contested because it only had gay men. And then the community itself said, we need more diversity. And they had to switch this up, right? And so you see how the more we know, the more we get into this, um, we're knee deep into this and uh, we might be neck um, deep soon, uh, but it gets more complex, but also it, it creates a, a playing field that acknowledges the victims, right? And, and I think that's important highlighting this um, with regards to some of these questions. I think Mariam has, has her hand up also. Yes, I just quickly wanted to add something um, to the question about minimizing injustice and um, the anthropologist Laura Nader has written something, um, or she, she once wrote that 
when we talk about justice, the opposite injustice is often absent. And I found that really interesting um, as an idea, because um, if we look at transitional justice, we often have this positive vision and instruments and mechanisms or measures that are supposed to bring justice somehow. And I think what, what we have seen in the last years or maybe even decade is focusing more on the injustices behind that and that make transitional justice necessary. And now there might be a turn again where we from like looking at the injustices now try to find other ways of, of justice now. So there might be a shift in focus again. Um, Thank you. And I think um, there was another question from another one of our, our students, Win Thi Tai Hua, Hua, who is from, from Vietnam, who was asking a question that was very similar in a way, to, or, or somewhat similar to Kazi's question. And she's asking that if there are countries that try to limit freedom of speech and media during the transition period, and how does that challenge kind of the, I guess, challenge transitional justice and the transition? I think this is getting more into kind of the, the politics of, of transitional justice. And there are a lot of examples. And I think that, for example, um, both Miriam and Arno are familiar with cases of, of rollbacks of, of transition and um, um, cases where, where could medium freedoms were, were quashed. And, and that kind of gets back to this question of, of both like the politics and also the, the advent and the emergence of, of more and more regime types that have quasi-democratic features, but also autocratic features as, as well, and, and how the language and discourses of transitional justice are instrumentalized in, in many different contexts, but they're also, they're, but they're very far removed from kind of what the, the normative goals of, of transitional justice would, would necessarily be. Um, and, and we see that in, in a lot of different contexts. Is there, is there anybody else who would like to add something to this? I, I think maybe um, Lauren could bundle because the, I've seen there are a couple questions that were addressed in, in a similar vein, but then um, highlighting that transformative angle. So maybe Lauren, you wanna take a stab at this? Yeah, sure. Um, I think in terms of, when we think about censorship, I think we can think about it in a very narrow rights-based sense, right? But we can also think about this process of inclusion and participation, right? And, and why maybe some survivors decide to participate where others may not. And in fact, they choose to remain silent and, and, and not tell their stories or, or, or there might be fear. If we think about like in the cases of Peru and in Guatemala, right? Indigenous populations were demonized as terrorists. So this is a whole reprocessing of, of, of re-enfranchising, of, of acknowledging them as citizens with dignity, right? And this isn't gonna happen overnight. And we have seen in both cases, even after the transition, democratic regimes still using those strategies and those tactics to marginalize, um, activist voices, right? Human rights defenders, land activists, uh, marginalize them by using these old tactics and, and othering them and making them seem that they're, they're not citizens, right? But rather threats to uh, the larger society. Now, in terms of transformative justice, I, I noticed that there's um, a couple of questions about the economic systems and you know, the basically the, the structural asymmetries and, and issues of structural violence. <laughs> These are great questions. <laughs> I'm so I'm just trying to sort of think about this. The problem is, and Patrick McAuliffe has written about this, is that transformative justice, right, is clearly in response to the limitations of transitional justice. We also have to acknowledge that even during these peace negotiations or, or and when these transitions are taking place, right, assuming that they are, they're incredibly fragile, right? They're, they are elite driven and elites have interests. So Sometimes, even though it might be at the forefront of survivors and, 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 and victims groups, it might be at the forefront of their uh, at the forefront of their claims to say, well, we want land distribution and we want, you know, an economic system that's just. And we've seen these claims we made in Colombia and Guatemala. They have been sidelined, right? The, the state hasn't protected these groups and, and, and their interests about that. So restructuring the economic system becomes a, a monumental task, right? Even if it is at the forefront of what survivors and victims would like to see, because they know in the long run, right? This is what's also going to 
help them thrive after trauma and mass violence. So there's some challenges, right? That there, there's some tensions that we need to flesh out with these claims. And that's also, I think there was another question about economic development, right? And there's been some work done looking at this intersection of transitional justice and development. Um, we know that especially in the early iterations of transitional justice in this quest for liberal democracy, it's been accompanied by neoliberal economic reforms. And, and that was to Chris's earlier points where even when political and civil rights were brought to the forefront saying this is what we want to highlight in a truth commission or as part of reparations, the social and economic justices were often sidelined, right? And then the continuation of a neoliberal economy had further marginalized these economic and social rights. And so that's why I also think we start to see these claims for transformative justice and even some of these movements that might operate outside of the mainstream transitional justice field, um, because they actually do see that in order for to have a thriving democracy, you need a, a just economic system. Those are just some preliminary thoughts. Thank you. I think Mariam, go ahead. Yes, uh, I thought that I might pick up one of the questions directed to Lauren as well. Uh, the one with regard to whether transitional justice is just Western centric. And um, I wanted to say um, that while that um, is probably fair to some degree, I would also um, like us not to forget that initial ideas of transitional justice were actually not developed necessarily in the global north, right? They traveled from, I mean, from the Americas, for example, Lauren has more about to say that, but um, also from other places. And then they like bundled somewhere in the global north, spread out again. But also if we look at the at the current bubble or the current island, I mean, there are like many experts as well that are not Western or not from the global north and uh, who, who work on, um, on the issue and that who actually interact with each other and also i mean with regard to ideas i mean if we look at the tunisian example i would um say that to some degree if we just reduce the experience or the process to western centric uh, or western dominated um process we actually deny those actors that were involved in developing what is going on um, some agency. I mean, taking the example of, of, um, of dignity, yeah? The uh, Tunisian um, Truth Commission is called um, a Truth and Dignity Commission and not a Truth and Reconciliation Commission as it's called in some other places. And one of the reasons is that um, the Tunisian um, uh, actress said, I mean, reconciliation is based on a Christian concept. We are not taking that up. And actually, dignity was one of the big demands in the revolution. So um, we're calling our truth commission a truth and dignity commission. So, yeah, well, I would say, I mean, of course, uh, this is fair to some degree, as uh, is it for most like liberal interventions. It's not entirely fair. And we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't forget uh, those parts of ideas and also of people that are non-Western that play their role, right, in, in these processes. I want to maybe yeah. bring, bring the uh, conversation a bit back to art and activism. And um, there, there was a question sort of that was asking from, from one of my students um, to what extent it is instrumental that, that activists um, are being heard and, and uh, I, I think yes, but it's a tricky, um, tricky endeavor because, as you know, when we think of the political arena, um, the the actors within that arena fight already, meaning the elites, and so to get access to that arena is quite quite difficult. But social media has done its fair share, um, um, despite the fake news uh, waves that have hit us in, in more recent years. But here. Many of you may be already familiar with this uh, concept of the Yolo, um, or Yolocaust and um, this very um, 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 annoying trend of selfie culture. And here you see the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. And this Israeli um, artist and, and activist has sort of taken these pictures and then put them in sort of a perspective, not necessarily always um, compared to the space where they were necessarily in, um, but sort of to, to raise awareness, right? And, and um, you can see here very well the, the, the different perspectives where someone's like, oh, hashtag Instagram, um, nice summer trip, I'm at the Holocaust Memorial. 
and and then in in this art exhibit sort of um this this effort of of showing like we need to be conscious about our acts we need to be very conscious of of how we how we interact of how we perceive memory and and again i don't think that, that there is sort of a silver bullet where we say this is the transition or this is the way we should look at things. Uh, but I think um, in, in an effort to sort of democratize also these efforts, um, certain freedoms come with responsibilities. And, and while sort of public education is, is a, big, a big step, um, I, I think opening up that transitional justice space to more actor voices, and Lauren mentioned sort of how indigenous voices has been, have been sidelined, how we in the US, um, um, even though um, 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 that, that we also needs to be sort of defined, uh, have, to, have to grapple with, with our um, um, slavery legacy. And um, there, is, um, there is a lot of efforts now um, towards the South, right? I think around George Mason University, um, Truth Commission efforts to, um, to talk things through and, and really reconceptualize how we ought to uh, move forward in that so that it's a constructive really dealing with it. But oftentimes we think about closing the books, right? And that's, that's the very much a wrong metaphor because you can't undo the past. And so you just really have to, to live with that. And no matter what level, whether it's the state, um, government, um, community level, or the very individual level, right? Everyone deals with trauma very, very differently. And, and um, on that note, I think I, I would also urge you to, uh, to go into, we haven't talked about this at all, but film Joshua Oppenheimer's Act of Killing or The Look of Silence are um, some very instrumental and, 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 and terrific um, pieces um, of, of um, cinematographic art and documentaries that, that have opened up a space with regards to Indonesia and its dealing with the past, right? So I don't know whether Eliza wants to say a few uh, words um, closing um, the, the round table or whether we want to go on. We said we'd stop around um, an hour after, but um, Chris warned us already that uh, um, contingent on questions, we might go an hour and a half. Um, I'm fine either way, um, but um, I'll, I'll maybe turn it over to Eliza and then we'll see um, where we stand. Yeah, thank you, Arno. And I think what you said about keeping the book open um, is so important. Um, and, and that's, you know, bringing, bringing it back to the very first question of this um, round table about what are some of the challenges to the field of transitional justice is facing. And, and, and one of the major ones is, is to not close the book, is to keep it um, open and permissible for people um, to keep talking about the past um, and, and, and keep talking about what a different future would look like um, and enacting those things. And I think um, bringing, bringing, kind of bringing that back to what I, I was touching upon with art is, is that the, the kind of creative forms and I know you brought up film as well um, and the, the Yolikos um, kind of social media approach as well um, these are these are forms that um, kind of uh, keep everything bubbling and, and keep it permissible um, for people to keep having conversations because one of the, the biggest challenges to transitional justice is kind of um, how do you approach intergenerational trauma and the, the longevity um, and impacts of um, uh, violence and conflict. And, and, and then touching upon what Lauren said, um, you know, how do you enact then those, those huge social transformations on a socio and economic um, scale? So I might leave my, my comment there and then, then pass back to Chris. Yeah, I think we could probably, I mean, if everybody is, is okay with it, um, kind of just take the last questions in a couple bundles because there are a couple themes that, that kind of come across um, kind of the, and the first is kind of in relation to art and transitional justice. I see at the very bottom, we have a, a question about the comfort woman statue in, in Germany. And, and also kind of another question by um, one of our students, another question by another one of our students here at Tokyo International University, asking about like, um, if ordinary people might not be able to understand or grasp 
the message that is intended through, through artwork um, as it might be considered high culture in most communities. So is it really as effective as we would think it would be? And that also relates to the significance of art and vis visualization in, in conveying memorials as, as well. And, and kind of one other question that's slightly kind of different is kind of the impact of the pandemic on, on transitional justice and, and whether or not we're gonna see a move to more kind of digital over physical spaces in terms of, of transitional justice activism. So in relation to the kind of the, the art question, I see Arnaud has, has his hand up and the, also the digital question perhaps as well. I wanted to briefly uh, point, even though um, that is not necessarily my field, but I think the, um, the statue or comfort women question is really, really interesting. And um, just a couple of days ago, I, I think that ties in with that uh, overall question. What is the role of foreign um, governments in, in, in promoting transitional justice? And um, we all are very much aware with regards to the uh, Latin transitional justice efforts in Latin America and um, sort of Spanish um, judges um, 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 harping really and, and pushing for um, universal jurisdiction, right? And that's why um, some of the um, former Bush administration members um, were not uh, were not traveling because they were they were afraid that to certain countries they were afraid that they might get locked up or arrested, right? On, on these charges, and and so I think the Supreme Court is uh, is currently um, sort of listening um, to arguments about sort of. Um, Holocaust survivors um, claims to property, right? When when their property were, was taken, um, um, and and so it, it specifically pertains to Germany and Hungary. And um, so when you have a class action suit, um, sometimes that that might be half or more than uh, a country's um, GDP uh, that, that that victims are asking for in, in reparations, right? Of course, this is highly symbolic, but that really raises a number of questions to what extent sort of the power of a domestic jurisdiction has over a foreign state. And that implicates then of course a department of state or a foreign ministry. And, and so uh, and you see how that becomes a very, very slippery slope. And I, I don't think we have straight answers to this. Germany is not necessarily known for its colonial history. It's known for um, 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 bad history that is, right? Uh, but, but they did have one nonetheless, and Namibia is one of the countries that was on their map. And for, for decades, um, I mean, the Namibian victims um, have, and the government has tried to lobby the German government of at least acknowledging it, right? And that brings us back into the issue of sequencing, right? If you recognize or acknowledge something, well, is the next step reparations or not, right? And in what traditionally what we've seen, that's the case. But again, it opens up Pandora's box or can of worms that these elite that these governments are not well in the place so that there's a lot of pushback on that right and so so i think we we can um discuss certain bottom-up demands without sort of forgetting um or looking at least at what what the elite structure this the so-called rule of law um has has created and um, while it's like to a certain extent empowering and people say like now these marginalized voices have a way to access justice it's also very limiting right and i, I want us to to remember that thanks yeah. mariam go ahead yes i uh, quickly want to jump in here and i'm now speaking half as a researcher and half as a citizen and i mean uh, yeah, with regard to Germany, I mean, one of the problems is, and um, I, I know brought up Max Scholleck's work uh, before, that there is this presentation or the self-presentation of Germany as a memory champion kind of, right? So we uh, have dealt so well with the Holocaust and we are still memorializing the Holocaust that there is actually no space and yeah, um, for talking about the colonial past, right? So, um, and, and if you if you look at the, the public discourse as well, every time the issue of the colonial past and the genocide um, of the Nama and Herero comes up, there is lots of public pushback that says, actually, I mean, we have the Holocaust to deal with, right? Isn't that enough? So, um, which I think is, is highly problematic. And we see, we've seen some movement in that uh, in the last years that there, there is, um, some pushing from from social movements, uh, but 
yeah, in, in recent times also from the political sphere for, for dealing with the colonial past. And I think especially if Germany wants to keep up that uh, public presentation as memory champion, we actually need to do so. And um, Germany has um, published a new foreign policy strategy on transitional justice last year, um, which uh, also relates to the own experience and then trying to be very context sensitive and discussing how Germany can harness that own experience for like furthering transitional justice abroad. And, but yeah, looking at the comfort women statue and the, the recent um, quarrels about that. Um, and I actually, maybe Chris knows how it ended, but I mean, the, the Japanese wanted it to be taken down and then there were protests. Um, so uh, I, I think Germany needs to yeah, decide whether they want to be consistent in their uh, domestic and foreign policy on transitional justice and memory and how to um, deal with that as well. So, yeah, I think I think it's going. I, I think it's going to remain from the last the last last that I that I heard, but it, it brings up kind of a, a good point in relation to kind of the intended message and whether or not kind of art is is effective. And I just like to point out for kind of um, kind of Oshadi who asked the question, it's it's really interesting if you look around Japan, right? Kind of officially, right? Japan protests these these statues being built in in Germany, but then last year there was there was an art festival where one of these statues was to play displayed within Japan. And on the one hand, yes, it's true, it provoked a very strong negative reaction to the point to where um, the the exhibit had to be temporarily closed. But but at the same time, right? Whether uh, kind of it, it triggered emotion, an emotive reaction, right? It wasn't not necessarily that that um, it 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 had no impact, but rather it was a space where kind of that that allowed for discussions to to take place in a context where otherwise you would not have that kind of that debate, that kind of public debate, and and that's why these these types of of kind of Either kind of exhibited artwork can be can be so powerful, right? And and we did have um, a, a speaker, um, David Shim, who spoke a couple of weeks ago, who's just published an article in Memory Studies um, on this statue and the can the material rhetoric of 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 these statues. So, um, with that thing, Elisa, do you want to add something? I did, sorry, I just messed with my screen for a second there. You read my mind, Chris. I did want to jump in on that point where you said that, um, you know, art and memorialization um, enables debate where it might not otherwise be possible. And I think that goes to, to speaks to, to one of the questions in the, in the, in the Q&A room about, um, you know, who has the ability to access the art and the intended audience and therefore kind of how um, democratic, if you like, are these, are these particular art forms. And I think one of the things that I said earlier in the round table is that art expands the possibility of uh, kind of who has the ability um, to see and say politics um, or have kind of political participation. Um, but equally on the flip side, it's who has the ability um, to, to receive these claims of political participation so that the contexts in which art is exhibited are just as important um, as the artworks themselves. And so if I go back to the, the example of the court, um, it's a really interesting one because um, as the, the person who asked the question about um, kind of um, accessibility of this particular artwork um, really kind of hit the nail on the head because um, th there is a tension at the court that, for instance, the court um, kind of um, in the discourse around the court, it, it speaks about being a public institution that's um, open and accessible to the public. And this is a public art collection. Um, that people can come and visit, um, you know, but the reality of it being a justice institution, um, it has been securitized in different ways. Um, people can't access it as freely as, as um, the kind of the founders of the court had in their idea um, or the kind of the ideals that they wished. And so this particular artwork, I, I would say that, yes, it's not accessible to everyone, um, what it does do in that space is that, and this has arisen um, out of field work I've done there, an interview with the judges of the court, is that it inhabits 
kind of what they call their judicial consciousness. And so it's actually an artwork that, if you like, is acting on um, the purveyors of justice at the court. And so it's not necessarily, it may have been intended um, to be publicly accessible, but kind of uh, that, that's not necessarily what's happening. Um, and in some senses, it's really important um, that this particular artwork is acting on the, this, um, on the judges and their judicial consciousness because it, it keeps the kind of um, their responsibility to, you know, to whom their kind of um, decisions affect at the forefront of their mind um, and, and the, the kind of the consequences um, that those decisions have. I might leave that one there. Thank you. Arno, did you have? Uh, I was thinking um, just in, in, in terms of being, being equal, uh, Lauren, do you have any final thoughts um, for? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I do want to just touch upon the pandemic question. Um, I think, you know, we, we probably all can agree in this space that the pandemic has only laid bare, <laughs> right? Injustices, structural inequalities. Um, it, these are not new things, right? So if anything, at least from the United States perspective, but also some of the, you know, the research that I'm doing abroad, I think if anything, it just further exacerbates, right? These really big questions that countries continue to deal with in the aftermath of, of conflict and, and of trauma, right? And, and in some cases we've seen um, states actually become more militarized, right? Because the military can often execute in a crisis in regards to the pandemic, but for countries, especially in, in Latin America, right? That history of military rule is a little wearisome. So I think, you know, these legacies of past violence in the context of the pandemic and how state institutions uh, and, and the capacity of, of the state, all right, state failures, the, the, they all come together, right? And I think it just increases the tension and demands for, for justice, uh, however they're articulated by, by citizens um, rather than push them aside. But that's just my immediate reaction. Thank you so much for that. And I think we've addressed, we've been able to address most of the, the questions in this kind of short period of, of time. And I'd like to thank once again, all of the speakers for, for taking time out of their schedules at very different parts of the day um, <laughs> where they all are kind of respectively to, to join us here. We're coming upon kind of midnight in, in Tokyo and it's even later um, in, in Australia. And um, thank you all for, for joining us this evening and I look forward to seeing you all back sometime in the future. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It was a great uh, Thank you. Be well.